Hey guys, welcome back. TJ here with Dead History and welcome to part two of our next vice presidential series installment as we're taking a look at the 23rd vice president of the United States, Adlai Ewing Stevenson. So I hope you, uh, hope you guys enjoyed part one yesterday, of course. Uh, part one, we took a look at the early life, you know, childhood, education, you know, kind of early political life and that sort of thing of Stevenson, uh, some personal life things. Uh, and then, of course, now today in part two, we're going to take a look at his vice presidency more in detail, his legacy, his life after politics, and then, of course, his death and then his grave site in Illinois, uh, which, of course, I have visited before. So uh, we're going to take all, a look at all that today in part two. Uh, I am flying solo for part two uh, for the audio here. Henry's not with me. So uh, let's just jump right in. Let's jump right in to Adlai Ewing Stevenson, our 23rd vice president of the United States. Here we go. Part two. Silver and gold. While such stories about Uncle Adlai brought smiles around Washington, Stevenson's presence as next in line to the presidency frightened Cleveland's more conservative supporters. Just before Cleveland took office, a financial panic on Wall Street had plunged the nation into depression. As a staunch advocate of limited government, Cleveland disapproved of any government program to reduce economic suffering. By contrast, Vice President Stevenson represented the populist doctrines of currency reform that were creeping into the Democratic Party. In June of 1893, after Cleveland proposed repeal of the Sherman Silver Purchase Act, and a return to the gold standard, one of his hard money supporters wrote Cleveland saying, I wish you had Congress in session now. You may not be alive in September. It would make a vast difference to the United States if you were not. The writer did not know that Cleveland faced a potentially fatal operation. A habitual cigar smoker Cleveland had developed cancer of the mouth that required immediate surgery. The president insisted that the surgery be kept secret to avoid another panic on Wall Street over the thought of a silverite like C Stevenson in the White House. While on a yacht in New York Harbor that summer, Cleveland had his entire upper jaw removed and replaced with an artificial device an operation that left no outward scar. The cancer surgery remained secret for another quarter century. Cleveland's aides explained that he had merely had dental work. His vice president little realized how close he came to the presidency that summer. Meanwhile, a major battle loomed in the Senate over currency reform. In 1890, the Republican President Harrison had supported the Sherman Silver Purchase Act in return for silver Republicans' support of the protective tariff named after Ohio Representative and future President William McKinley. But in the 1890 elections, the unpopular McKinley tariff defeated Many Republicans, including McKinley, restored Democratic majorities in Congress and bolstered the populist movement that was demanding more government intervention in railroad regulation, currency reform, and farm relief. Disdainful of the populace, Cleveland interpreted the Republican defeat as vindication of his policies. Upon re-entering the White House in 1893, he was determined to repeal the Sherman Act to restore business confidence and therefore called Congress into extraordinary session 
in August to consider the issue. In October of 1893, efforts to repeal the Sherman Silver Purchase Act met with a filibuster in the Senate. Indiana Senator Daniel Voorhees, leader of the Cleveland Democrats, announced that the Senate would remain in continuous session until a vote was taken. Opponents made repeated calls for quorums, feigned illness, and refused to appear even when summoned by the Senate Sergeant-at-Arms. Those conducting the filibuster benefited from the cooperation of the presiding officer. Vice President Stevenson refused to turn his back on the Silverites, who had helped to nominate him and gave no aid to the administration in whipping the dissenters into line. The prominent Washington correspondent, Julian Ralph, knew that the Senate had no formal cloture procedure, but heard that it might be possible for the vice president to cut off debate by simply ordering a vote. Ralph asked the opinion of former House Speaker Thomas B. Reed, who had broken similar dilatory actions in the House by counting the minority as present even if they failed to answer the role. Reed asserted that the vice president could do whatever he pleased if he had a majority behind him. But Democrat Isham G. Harris of Tennessee, or Isham, the president pro tempore, strongly disagreed. Why, sir, I don't believe he would live to accomplish it, said Harris, who later repudiated the threatening quote when it appeared in the Ralph story. New York Democratic Senator David Hill followed Ralph's suggestion by circulating a petition to force the vice president to overrule all dilatory motions, but it failed to attract many signers. Nor were Democrats able to agree on adoption of a cloture rule, or cloture or cloture rule. Finally, the Senate accepted a compromise arranged by Maryland Democratic Senator Arthur Pugh Gorman that established a gradual reduction of silver purchases over a three-year period. Although this agreement made possible passage of the repeal, President Cleveland never forgave Gorman for his compromise and thereafter rarely consulted this important Democratic leader. Repeal of the Sherman Silver Purchase Act only contracted the currency and further weakened the economy. Silverites called it the crime of 1893. The Democrats became tagged as the party of the empty dinner pail and suffered sweeping congressional defeats in 1894. A notable sense of humor. Adlai Stevenson enjoyed his role as vice president, presiding over the most august legislative assembly known to men. He won praise for ruling in a dignified, nonpartisan manner. In personal appearance, he stood six feet tall and was of fine personal bearing and uniformly courteous to all. Although he was often a guest at the White House, Stevenson admitted that he was less an advisor to the president than the neighbor to his counsels. He credited the president with being courteous at all times but noted that no guards were necessary to the preservation of his dignity, no one would have thought of undue familiarity. For his part, President Cleveland snorted that his vice president had surrounded himself with a coterie 
of free silvermen dubbed the Stevenson Cabinet. The president even mused that the economy had gotten so bad and the Democratic Party so divided that the logical thing for me to do was to resign and hand the executive branch to Mr. Stevenson, joking that he would try to get his friend's jobs in Stevenson's new cabinet. Toward the end of his term, Uncle Adlai was a dinner guest at the home of Senator Gorman. The vice president had a strong sense of humor, which he suppressed while presiding over the Senate, but let loose in private. At dinner, Stevenson said he resented the familiar charge that vice presidents were never consulted by the president and told a story about Vice President John Breckinridge once being consulted by President James Buchanan about the wording of his Thanksgiving message. Has Mr. Cleveland yet consulted you to that extent? Senator Gorman asked. Not yet, Stevenson replied, but there are still a few weeks of my term remaining. Stevenson was mentioned as a candidate to succeed Cleveland in 1896. Although he chaired the Illinois delegation to the Democratic National Convention, he gained little support. As one Democrat noted, the young men of the country are determined to have something to say during the next election and are tired of these old hacks. Stevenson received a smattering of votes, but the convention was taken by storm by a 36-year-old former representative from Nebraska, William Jennings Bryan, who delivered his fiery cross of gold speech in favor of of a free silver plank in the platform. Not only did the Democrats repudiate Cleveland by embracing free silver, but they also nominated Bryan for president. Many Cleveland Democrats, including most Democratic newspapers, refused to support Bryan. But Vice President Stevenson loyally endorsed the ticket. In the fall, Bryan conducted the nation's first whistle-stop campaign, traveling extensively around the country and capturing people's imaginations. Although he did far better than expected, he lost the election to Ohio's Republican governor, William McKinley. A bimetallist himself, McKinley ran on a gold standard platform, but McKinley wanted to enact a protective tariff and to win support from silver Republicans, he promised to appoint a bipartisan commission to negotiate an international agreement in bimetallism. Silverites hoped that a prominent Democrat might be appointed but when their leading candidates declined, they settled for a man of no particular weight, the former vice president. The work of the commission came to naught. Stevenson found more satisfaction as a political speaker addressing all things purely and absolutely democratic. After the 1896 election, Bryan became the titular leader of the Democrats and frontrunner for the nomination in 1900. Much of the newspaper's speculation about who would run as the party's vice presidential candidate centered on Indiana Senator Benjamin Shively, or Shively. But when reporter Arthur Wallace Dunn interviewed Shively at the convention, the senator said he did not want the glory of a defeat as a vice presidential candidate. A disappointed Dunn said that he still had to file a story on the vice presidential nomination 
and then added, I believe I'll write a piece about old Uncle Adlai. That's a good idea, said Shively. Shively. I believe it's Shively. Stevenson is just the man. There you have it. Uniting the old Cleveland element with the new Brian democracy. You've got enough for one story. But say, this is more than a joke. Stevenson is just the man. For the rest of the day, Dunn heard other favorable remarks about Stevenson, and by that night, the former vice president was the leading contender since no one else was very anxious to be the tail of what they considered was a forlorn forlorn hope ticket. The populists had already nominated the ticket of Brian and Charles A. Town, a silver Republican from Minnesota. With the ticket, understanding that Town would step aside if the Democrats nominated someone else. Brian preferred his good friend Town, but Democrats wanted one of their own, and the regular element of the party felt comfortable with Stevenson. Town withdrew and campaigned for Brian and Stevenson. As a result, Stevenson, who had run with Cleveland in 1892, now ran with his nemesis Brian in 1900. 25 years senior to Brian, Stevenson added age and experience to the ticket. Nevertheless, their effort never stood a chance against the Republican ticket of McKinley and Theodore Roosevelt. Stevenson returned again to private practice in Illinois, making one last attempt at office in an unsuccessful race for governor in 1908. After that, he retired to Bloomington, where his Republican neighbors described him as windy but amusing. Grandfather and Grandson Through Stevenson's long career, his wife Letitia was a keen observer and judge of people and a charming hostess. Although suffering from migraine headaches and severe severe rheumatism that forced her to wear leg braces when standing at receptions, she dutifully supported his many political campaigns. Letitia also helped establish the Daughters of the American Revolution as a way of healing the divisions between the North and South after the Civil War. She succeeded Mrs. Benjamin Harrison as the DAR's second president general. Adlai Stevenson II remembered his grandparents' home as a very formal household. The vice president addressed his wife as Mrs. Stevenson, and she called him Mr. Stevenson. Young Adlai considered his grandfather one of the great raconteurs of his day, and learned much about American history and politics from him. At his grandfather's house in Bloomington, he met many distinguished Democrats from around the land, including William Jennings Bryan. He recalled that hanging on the wall was a lithograph, the lost bet, depicting a gentleman in top hat and frock coat paying off an election bet by pulling a wagon down a street beneath a banner that read Grover Cleveland and Adlai E. Stevenson. Adlai Stevenson died in Bloomington on June 14th of 1914. 38 years later, his grandson and namesake, then serving as governor of Illinois, agonized over whether to make himself available for the Democratic nomination for president. When Adlai E. Stevenson II 
appeared on the television news show, Meet the Press, a reporter from the Chicago Daily News pressed him for a commitment by saying, wouldn't your grandfather, Vice President Stevenson, twirl in his grave if he saw you running away from a chance to be the Democratic nominee in 1952? Stevenson, who loathed giving up his governorship for what most likely would be a futile campaign against the war hero Dwight Eisenhower, blanched at the comparison and replied, I think we have to leave grandfather lie. So guys, that's pretty much it. For Adlai Stevenson, uh, I am going to go over some, you know, more things. Just kind of another brief overview. Um, so here you go. His vice presidency from 1893 to 1897. Cleveland was re-nominated for, re-nominated for president on the first ballot at the 1892 Democratic National Convention in Chicago. At the time, the vice presidency was considered a final resting place for has-beens and never wases. Nonetheless, Stevenson's brothers and cousins advocated for his nomination for the position. Likewise, Mayor of Chicago, Chicago Carter Harrison, threw his support behind Stevenson as a native son, believing that he could influence the state to vote Democratic. And Stevenson was nominated on the first ballot. Stevenson backed off his former support of greenbacks in favor of Cleveland's gold standard policy. Unlike Cleveland, who only appeared once in public to support his candidacy, Stevenson traveled with his wife across the country. Cleveland's advisors sent Stevenson to the South to curb the growing appeal of the populist party. With his Kentucky roots, Stevenson proved popular at his Southern engagements. Stevenson also publicly opposed the Lodge Bill, a proposed bill which would have enfranchised Southern blacks. The winning Cleveland Stevenson ticket carried Illinois, although not Stevenson's home district. So just to take a look at the uh, election, of course, that got him nominated uh, no, nominated and elected. It was the 1892 presidential election, of course. Uh, in 1892, it was Grover Cleveland, the Democrat. Uh, his running mate, of course, was Adlai Stevenson. Uh, he was going up against the Republican Benjamin Harrison, uh, whose running mate was White Law Reed. And then there was also the Populist Party uh, nominee, who was James B. Weaver, and his running mate was James G. Field. Um, it was not overly close. Uh, Cleveland and Stevenson carried 23 states. Harrison and Reed carried 16. And Weaver and Field carried five. The electoral vote count was Stevenson and Cleveland 277 to Harrison Reed 145 to Weaver and Field to 22. Popular vote, 46% went to Cleveland and Stevenson. Uh, so, you know, they won. wasn't a runaway, uh, but they won fairly convincingly. Uh, so, of course, you're seeing some maps, some campaign posters, um, you know, all that kind of stuff that I always show for the election that got uh, not only the vice president we're speaking of nominated, but also elected. And that, of course, was, like I said, the election of 1892. So a little more about Stevenson's vice presidency. Uh, civil service reformers held out hope for the second Cleveland administration, but saw Vice President Stevenson as a symbol of the spoils system. He never hesitated to feed names of Democrats to the post office department. Once he called at the U.S. Treasury Department to protest against an appointment and was shown a letter he had written endorsing the candidate. Stevenson told the Treasury officials not to pay attention to any of his written endorsements. If he really favored someone, he would tell them personally. 
course, I, you know, I told you guys this, of course, uh, in part one a bit. And then we touched on this earlier. A habitual, a habitual cigar smoker, uh, Grover Cleveland, developed, developed cancer of the mouth. Uh, of course, he kept it a secret. He was on a yacht in the New York Harbor. He had surgery, removed uh, basically his entire upper jaw, replaced it. We knew all that. Um, we, you know, yeah. So, I mean, you know, Stevenson enjoyed his role as vice president, presiding over the U.S. Senate. Um, you know, we already kind of read all this and knew all this. Um, so that's pretty much his vice presidency in a nutshell. And then, of course, we move on to what we already just discussed a little bit ago, the presidential campaigns of 1896 and 1900. So, as I said, Stevenson was mentioned as a candidate to succeed Cleveland in 1896. Uh, we already talked about all this with Brian, with William Jen Jennings Bryan. Um, so, we got all that. Um, let me see. The populace had already nominated Ticket of Bryan, Charles A. Town. We already went into all this. We already read all this. Like I said, it's almost verbatim exactly what I had already kind of went over with you guys. Um... Let me see here. Uh, da, 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 da. As a result, Stevenson had a run in Cleveland in 1892. Now ran, blah, blah, blah. 25 years his senior. We already read all this. Uh, Stevenson's role in the race is perhaps... This is the race... Uh, I'm referring to the re race in 1900 when uh, Stevenson teamed up with William Jennings Bryant. Stevenson's role in that race is perhaps more distinguished by his being the third vice president to win nomination for that office with a different running mate after having completed his first term. George Clinton served in Thomas Jefferson's second term and James Madison's first. John C. Calhoun served under John Quincy Adams and then in Andrew Jackson's first term. As of 2020, Republican Charles W. Fairbanks' failure to win a second VP term in 1916 is the only example since. So pretty interesting about Stevenson's role in that race in 1900 because uh, it's perhaps more distinguished by his being the third vice president to win nomination for the office with a different running mate after having completed his first term. So it is kind of interesting there. Little fun fact. Uh, and now just a little bit more about his final years. By May of 1899, the North American Trust Company had directors such as John G. Carlisle, Adlai E. Stevenson, and Wa Wager Swain. After the 1900 election, Stevenson returned again to private practice in Illinois. I told you he made one last attempt at office in a race for governor of Illinois in 1908 at age 73. Losing narrowly. In 1909, he was brought in by founder Jesse Grant Chapline to a distance learning school, LaSalle Extension University. After that, he retired to Bloomington, Illinois, where his Republican neighbors described him, as I said, windy but amusing. Adlai Stevenson died in Chicago on June 14th of 1914 at age 78. His body is interred in a family plot in Evergreen Cemetery in Bloomington, Illinois. Stevenson's son, Louis G. Stevenson, was Illinois Secretary of State from 1914 to 1917. Stevenson's grandson, Adlai Ewing Stevenson II, was the Democratic candidate for president in 1952 and 1956, and governor of Illinois. And his great-grandson, Adlai Ewing Stevenson III, was a U.S. senator from Illinois from 1970 to 1981, and an unsuccessful candidate for governor of Illinois in 1982 and 1986. So, definitely a very long lineage and history, family history of uh, politics in the Stevenson family, no doubt. Very, very uh, prominent, uh, you know, political family. 
Of course, legacy in 1962, Stevenson's alma mater, Center College, or Center College, named a newly built residence hall, Stevenson House, in his honor. They had previously awarded him an honorary degree in 1893. So there you have it, guys. There you, that's pretty much the life, legacy, vice presidency, death, and burial uh, site, gravesite of our 23rd vice president of the United States, Adlai Ewing Stevenson. Uh, you are seeing a couple pictures here uh, on the screen of his gravesite. That is at the Evergreen Cemetery in Bloomington, Illinois. Of course, these are my pictures from my visit of his gravesite. So, uh, taking a look at a couple of them. You know, pretty basic uh, gravesite, to be honest. Kind of plain and boring. It is a family plot. Most of the Stevenson family is buried there. The one thing I do love about the Evergreen Cemetery in Bloomington is these really cool signs. Uh, that you're actually seeing on your screen now. They have those that, like, you know, right around where somebody famous is buried. They're really nice, really well-made and, you know, informative and pretty cool. So I, I like those. Um, another thing you're seeing, you're also going to be seeing pictures of his homes. I showed this in part one. Uh, these are all stock photos. None of these are my personal photos. I did not visit any of these homes. But you're going to be seeing a sign uh, from Kentucky where he was born uh, that says basically, you know, he was born uh, here. Uh, Stevenson was in 1852. Uh, you know, all this kind of stuff. Um, so uh, I'm sorry, he was born in 1835. He moved to Illinois in 1852. I apologize. Misspoke there. But you're seeing that sign in Kentucky. There's a roadside sign. None of, you know, the farm where he was born is still standing. Nothing of that is still around. And then, of course, you're seeing pictures. I showed some of these in part one. The Stevenson House, which was the home of uh, Adlai Stevenson. He and his bride, Letitia, moved to this house following their 1866 wedding. And they lived here until 1868. Um, this is in the uh, Metamora, Illinois house. That's what you're seeing. Uh, pictures of and then there's this other nice house that you're seeing this was the home of Adlai Stevenson um basically I believe this is the Bloomington house actually uh that you're seeing the White House I think that's the Bloomington house that he lived at so all of these different homes of his um you know those pictures those roadside markers none of that are my photos those are all stock photos but I wanted to show you Roadside marker where he was born in Kentucky, his home in uh, Metamora, Illinois, and then, of course, his home in Bloomington, Illinois. So several different homes and stuff such that are preserved and do have signs and are recognized as Stevenson's homes. So pretty cool stuff. Those are those are all, uh, you know, in Kentucky with the birthplace and then Illinois with the homes. Pretty cool. So there you go, guys. So stay tuned for a very little bit of bonus footage. I'll show you all of my photos from my visit to his gravesite in Bloomington, Illinois. So stay tuned for that bonus footage. And then uh, that's it. So like I told you in part one, next week we are taking the week off. Maybe there will be a live stream. Maybe. I'm not sure yet. I don't have anything booked yet. We shall see. And then... The following week after that, we will be back with our next vice presidential series installment, looking at the next vice president, who, of course, is, anybody know? The 24th vice president of the United States, Garrett Hobart, a New Jersey guy. So it's going to be a lot of fun. That's why we're taking the week off. Lots of bonus footage coming up for Garrett Hobart since it's right here in New Jersey. So stay tuned for that. Uh, and there you go, guys. Thanks so much. Thank you for watching. Thank you for all the comments and questions. Please keep all those coming. Thank you for all the support. You guys are wonderful. Cannot thank you enough. And hope you enjoyed this look at Adlai Ewing Stevenson. We will see you uh, in about a week and a half to two weeks. Uh, and enjoy yourselves. Enjoy playoff football. 
Enjoy the snow if you're getting it. Enjoy skiing, snowboarding, whatever you do. Or just enjoy sitting inside by the fire and watching great dead history YouTube videos. So I appreciate it, guys. Thanks so much. See you soon. Bye-bye now.